Okay. What time is it? 11.36. Time to start. Okay. Cool. Hey. Is this set up here? Or do I gotta hold the mic for that one? Okay, is it gonna interfere? Okay. Of course. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, feel free to come and go, sit down, eat, whatever you want. I'm going to go ahead and talk to you all while you eat. Um, since we're doing things a little bit different, um, let's go ahead and we'll save uh, questions for the end. When I get done, then I'll answer any questions you may have. So, all right. Well, my name is Ryan Spring. I am the GIS GPS specialist for the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma Historic Preservation Department. Uh, to keep it simple, I make maps. That's my primary job, is to make cultural maps to help uh, educate and to help facilitate. Um, I'm also a researcher and an advisor for Choctaw culture and Choctaw history. So if you ever have any questions, um, you can email or call our department, my extensions 2137 or you can email me at rspring at choctawnation.com but anyway today we are going to talk about the Choctaw Light Horseman the Asoba on Benili Tushka um, we're gonna keep it quick and kinda breeze through this presentation it's usually a 45 minute presentation and I'm gonna try to limit it down to 30 minutes um, but as most people know I go over so I will try so for those that don't know about the Choctaw Light Horsemen, um, they were the principal law enforcement for Choctaws in Mississippi and Indian Territory, roughly between 1820 to 1907. They settled uh, all disputes, they made arrests, and they carried out sentences. So they were the primary police force for the Choctaw Nation in Mississippi and Indian Territory. So there's a picture on the left of some light horsemen. Uh, as you can see, they look pretty Choctaw. <laughs> Got that stoic look. Before I talk about the light horsemen, I need to talk a little bit about Choctaw government structure and the clan system and how law enforcement was done prior to the light horsemen. So I'm gonna breeze through it. Um, I've done a presentation on clan structure before, so this is just a basic overview. Um, the Choctaw government was organized into three Oftis, or council fires. Um, most historians call them, you know, our districts. So you have the Oklafalaya, or the Long People. They were to the northwest. You had the Ahipat Okla, or the Potato Eaters. They were to the northeast. And you had the Okla Hanale, or the Six Towns, to the south. These are also referred to, starting from top to bottom, as the Pushma, I'm sorry, as the Apukshinubi District, the Mashola Tubby District, and the Pushmataha District. So the way that Choctaw government worked before, um, before the Light Horsemen was the society was organized around the Ixa. The Ixa are the Moides in the Choctaw uh, system. So you would have two moieties in each village. You would have the Okla in Halata, or the beloved people, and you'd have the Kashapa Okla, or the divided people. So a lot of times when people talk about Choctaw clans, these are, the moieties are over the clans. So throughout time, each moiety would have anywhere between four to 16 clans, depending on the time period. So through time it changed. Choctaw society, like any other society, changes through time. So, as before, you have the Okla in Halata, or the Beloved People, and the Kashapa Okla, or the Divided People. So, 
what would happen is um, these two clan, these two moieties, would make decisions for the community. If there was to be some sort of dispute, the family members or the clan mothers would come together, and they would work to find a conclusion. So let's you know, so if a law was broken, the guilty party would compensate the offended party. So let's say you had a Choctaw man that was drunk and he wandered into the village and he tripped and caught a house on fire. If no one was injured or if no one passed away, that man and his clan, or I'm sorry, his moiety would be liable to compensate the other family and the other moiety for the damages of that house. So his family may come together and help build a new house for that family or whatever that the, the, um, the women decided on. Now, if someone were to pass away in that fire, then usually what would happen is there would have to be a price. Usually the man that um, had started the fire would be uh, executed to reimburse the family for their loss. It didn't matter if it was an accident or on purpose. Um, usually someone would be um, compensated that way. So it's, you know, an eye for an eye. And it may seem harsh, but this kept society working well and it kept the Choctaws, uh, how do I say it? it? It kept everything working out well. <laughs> the look on their face. So, I didn't explain that very well, but basically it held the structure of the society together using this system. If that gentleman, for whatever reason, could not be put to death, either he fled, which was very, very rare, um, then another family member in his stead would be executed in his place. Um, usually that person that would go to execution would not be immediate. They'd be given up to a year to get all their um, everything in their family up to date. So to make sure that the harvest was planted, to make sure that everything was going okay. And then in the fall, they would then go to their execution, um, just on you know a day of their choosing. So, and this is how Choctaw society ran for hundreds of years. But things happened. Society changed, like I said. All societies, all people changed through time. Choctaws, for instance, saw things that they liked from American society and European society and incorporated it into their own and adapted those things into them. Thus, our traditional dress, um, using metal implements, all these things, Choctaw said, hey, that's better than what we have, let's use that. So, a lot of Western influences started coming in to the Choctaw people. Uh, trade, uh, intermarriage, Western diplomacy, Western schools, so, you know, you see a lot of traders coming in from Mobile or uh, New Orleans wanting to trade with Choctaws. Well, these are European men. These are American men. They're used to working with other men. So, usually women only owned property in Choctaw society. So, if you went to a man to try to trade for something, he doesn't own anything. He doesn't have anything. Well, what started happening, happening is the men started being the brokers. They'd talk with their wives and they would start getting material wealth. So over time, men started owning property. Uh, intermarriage, a lot of times what you see is Choctaw society's matriarchal. It's based off of uh, a powerful uh, structure. The society is run by the women. Women are the only ones that are going to own property. So your status in society for women is based off of uh, one part your material wealth, maybe lineage. Um, so what would happen is, like for my family, my kin came in through Mobile as a blacksmith. And he found a high status Choctaw family, married with them, and thus he became high status. Because he married a Choctaw woman that was high status. And he became one of the three blacksmiths in the Choctaw Nation. Many, many uh, Americans did this. They would come in, find a prominent Choctaw woman, marry into their family, and then gain influence in Choctaw society. And this was okay, this was part of the Choctaw society. So, um, but there's changes with that. You have, um, you know, the 
the European system, the American system is very male dominant. So you start to see a change in society between the men and the women. Western diplomacy, um, Americans had been coming in for several, 1801 all the way through 1830, treaties with Choctaw people. They're coming in and seeding land, or making the Choctaw people seed land. Um, so Choctaw, the chiefs especially, were starting to become very good diplomats. In the Treaty of 1816, it was said that the Choctaws were crude businessmen and they actually took advantage of the United States in that treaty. So the United States rewrote the treaty and made the Choctaws sign that new one. So, in Western schools, Choctaws were seeing a change. They saw that they would have to educate themselves in the American manner. So they started bringing in missionaries that brought in schools and they started sending their young off to schools. Because of this, Choctaw youth, mixed blood and full blood, are then going out and learning American ways of practice, learning American ideology. So all these different changes are having influence and the normal clan system is evolving. It's changing and there's this rift where the Moides can, or the Ixa can no longer control the law. So in 1820, some of the missionaries got together with the chiefs and they created the Choctaw Light Horsemen. Now other tribes in the southeast had adopted Light Horsemen by this time. I know the Cherokees for sure. So the Choctaws also picked up on this model. So at this time period from 1820 till 1837, the Light Horsemen acted as the judge, jury, and executioner. They enacted all the punishments. Uh, there were no appeals and they settled all disputes. So that story I said earlier about that man, um, you know, uh, damaging property, it would now be up to the Light Horsemen after 1820 to settle that dispute. And they had full control over all of it. Now a lot of people um, from the Western mindset might think, well, there's a probability for corruption. Well, at this time period, there was none. And throughout the history of the Light Horsemen, there's very little. Because the Light Horsemen were chosen from the most honorable people in Choctaw society. They weren't elected in, they were chosen by the community. They didn't have to be Choctaw. They could be white as long as they were, you know, like I said, married into a Choctaw family. Back then, there was no blood quantum. So as long as you were involved in the culture, you were involved in the society, you were at Choctaw, as long as you were adopted in by the, um, the Ixa. Um, so these are some of the laws that were first enforced. Liquor law, theft, adultery, murder. Those were the first ones at that time, in this time period. Um, to make a note, of course, 1830, 1830 was Dancing Rabbit Creek when Choctaws were removed to Indian Territory. 1831, 32, 33 were the removal years. So that's when Choctaws were forcefully removed from Mississippi, Alabama to Indian Territory. The Choctaw government wasn't reestablished until 1834. When that happened, the Light Horsemen were reestablished. And 1834 was also our first constitution that was passed by our council. Now, in 1837, the reason the Light Horsemen changed is because there was a new constitution that had to be adapted. Um, as some of you may know, the Chickasaw people were removed in 1837. They were not given land when they were removed, so they were put in with the Choctaw Nation. And they became a political minority under the Choctaw Nation. At this time, Choctaws and Chickasaws didn't get along. Chickasaws had a long history of slave raiding Choctaw people for over 100 years. So, at this time period, the two tribes didn't get along. Um, it wasn't like an all-out blood feud, but, you know, there were some differences. I mean, they're two separate tribal people. So anyway, so a new constitution was adapted to account for the new Chickasaws that were put in. But with the new constitution, new adaptations. Um, instead of a, a system of government with only one council, this constitution uh, got a bicameral government. So you had your council, but you also had judges. So this took away that 
um, judge and jury from the Light Horsemen. So instead, the Light Horsemen are enforcing the judgments of the tribal judges, which is extremely important because now that we have a unified court system, the Light Horsemen are now there to support the court system. Um, the Light Horsemen were, oh yeah, they were uh, six Light Horsemen per district, so they were reduced down in number. And they served two year terms, so they were then elected. But like I said, you had to be very honorable to be a Light Horseman. Uh, the Whiskey Law was passed. There's some other things. Within this 1838 to 1859, the first jail was finally created, and it was very rarely used. So again, Choctaw still did not have a need for jail because Choctaw people would go to their own execution if they were to be executed. A lot of times these jails were set up for whites that would come in to Indian Territory and they'd be jailed until the U.S. Marshals would come and get them. Um, in this picture you can see the light horsemen. By this time period, Choctaw people are wearing clothing just like any other normal Americans. So the light horsemen were dressed up just like the U.S. Marshals. So they had revolvers, rifles, shotguns. Uh, they wore, you know, similar clothing for that time period. Um, if you've ever read the book True Grit, it talks about how when, um, it's much later, but they go across the uh, Arkansas River and they run into Choctaws and they say, well, they're dressed up like everyone else. How are, you know, how are they called savages when, you know, they're waving and smiling at us like, you know, any other American. Here's a good quote that I found on the Light Horsemen, just kind of how they were dressed and their demeanor. The Light Horsemen were what the name indicates. They were a hard riding, straight shooting, hard fighting body of men who carried no excess equipment such as militiamen carry. They had a horse, a saddle, a rifle, and a revolver with a regular equipment, while a few hands full of parched corn and some jerked beef in their pockets or saddlebags was the ration this army subsisted on while they moved swiftly from place to place. So Choctaw Light Horsemen had Choctaw Ponies. They didn't have the American Quarter Horse. Choctaw Ponies are a lot hardier, they're smaller, they're quicker. They come from the Spanish uh, Mustang stock that DeSoto brought over in the 1500s. They don't even need to be shooed because their hooves are so strong. They're used to rocky terrain. So these were very quick. They could get from place to place. You know, it t from Durant, it takes me three hours to drive to Poto. Well, that's really quick for our terms, but these men could probably ride that route, you know, just in a few days when it would take normal people, you know, a long time. So they could move from place to place very quickly. Uh, between 1838 and 1859, there were more laws that were passed. I'm not going to go through them, but as you can see, there start to be some... Um, uh, monetary value placed and uh, also death penalty placed depending on which law was broken and you have first offense and second offense in eighteen sixty we have the american civil war choctaws were pulled into the american civil war as allies of the confederacy they did not fight I like to make this point. They did not fight for the Confederacy. They were allies with the Confederacy. Um, so the reason I make this point is because when the war ended um, and the Confederacy gave, um, you know, signed their treaty with the United States, uh, the tribes in Indian Territory were still at war with the United States. So we uh, quickly had to uh, find somebody and sign a treaty. Um, but anyway, during this time period, laws destabilized. Um, you have a lot of chaos in Indian Territory, just like in the, in the South. Uh, you have refugees coming in. The, the Cherokees, the Seminoles, the Creeks, their lands are being destroyed by outlaws, by vandals. They're being destroyed f because of the war. So we have a lot of refugees coming into the Choctaw Nation. Raiders and outlaws are raiding and burning. A lot of times you see a lot of structures from the 1830s didn't make it because they were burned during the Civil War. 
and there's a lack of food. By this time period, Choctaws had switched from the women being in charge of agriculture to the men. Well, the men are all out fighting, so there's no one to tend the crops. So for three or four years, there's no crops being made. It was said that one in every three families were destitute within the Choctaw Nation, and it was worse for the other tribes. So, of course, the changes right here that are listed were adopted before the Civil War, but because of all the issues of the Civil War, the Light Horsemen had a very hard time for the next several decades trying to catch up. But there were other issues that I'll get into in a second that came with the end of the Civil War. But looking at the 1816 Treaty, um, the death penalty was changed from being hung till shot until dead, which is just another adaptation. That's what the United States had started doing too. Um, the light horse were actually replaced by county sheriffs and rangers. So by this time period, instead of the districts, we actually had counties within our districts. So, and then within those counties, we had sheriffs and rangers. So each district chief was appointed his own light horseman as a peace officer and a messenger. But that light horseman could still deputize any Choctaw citizen to be deputy light horseman to help him if, they, if he needed help. And the national treasurer was allowed two light horsemen. I guess they figured out that he got robbed way too often. So they gave him some people to help. On the right, I have some notable outlaws. These were just some of the gangs that were coming through. Uh, during this period from 1816 to 1894. I won't go into detail on them, but these are just some of the notable ones. After the American Civil War, we have the Treaty of 1866. This treaty is important because it ceded the western lands from the Choctaw and Chickasaws. So in 1838, no, sorry, 1855, the Chickasaw people were upset and they forced the US government to bring Choctaw Nation into treaty negotiations. And the Choctaws, the US government and the Chickasaws decided upon giving the Chickasaw Nation their own land. And I'll show you a map in the next slide that has all that. But some of that land that was now shared between the two tribes was ceded in this treaty. Uh, railroads and other companies were allowed to be brought in. This really, the Treaty of 1866 further crippled uh, Choctaw sovereignty in Indian Territory. Once railroads came through, once normal commerce, uh, post office started going through, uh, Choctaw people started being marginalized. They were no longer in charge of their lands as much as they used to be. And this also allowed federal agents to come into Choctaw and Chickasaw lands like the U.S. Marshals, where beforehand they weren't allowed to come in unless with Choctaw consent. Now they were allowed to come and go as they needed. This is a map that was done from the land session office. I think this is one of Royce's maps. So this whole land from here all the way over was what Choctaws received in 1820 from the Treaty of Doak Stan. In 1820, ooh, 1825, this area was taken from Choctaw people. In 1830, Choctaws were moved into this area. And as I said before, in 1855, this is the area that was ceded to the Chickasaw Nation. This is the area that the Chickasaw people are in today. These lands over here were called leased lands. They were lands that neither tribe used. Um, a lot of the Plains tribes were in these areas and they raided any time uh, Choctaws or Chickasaws tried to settle or trade. So we kind of left those lands open. In 1866, the U.S. government took those lands and later removed in many of the Plains tribes. You see the Wichitas, the Kiowas, Comanche, Apache, Cheyenne, Arapaho, all of them were then removed into these areas. And these were, a lot of them were enemies with the Choctaw and Chickasaw people at this time period because we were removed into their lands. They weren't happy with us being there, but. So to start wrapping up, the Light Horsemen, I need to change this date. The Light Horsemen were dissolved in 1906, along with the Choctaw Nation. Um, 
But there was a small issue in the late eight, in basically 1895. There's a gentleman named Silent Lewis that was put to execution. The light horsemen went out to execute him. They shot him, but he didn't die immediately. And they had to spend several minutes smothering him. And he died a very agonizing death. This hit the local newspapers, and a lot of people got upset. And um, they went to the court system and everything. So this was the last individual that was executed by the Choctaw Nation in our history, as far as I know. Um, this is a picture of the execution here after they had smothered him. Um, but 1907 is when the tri or 1906 is when the tribe was dissolved. Throughout the 1890s and early 1900s, there was something called the Dawes and the Curtis Act. Many of you have heard of allotment. It's the reason why we don't have reservation in Oklahoma. It's because of this allotment process. And after 1906, the Choctaw government, its sovereignty was dissolved. And from 1906 all the way to 1975, our chiefs were appointed by the U.S. president. So they were no longer selected by the Choctaw people until uh, Nixon came in and started passing laws to allow us to have our first 1978 constitution and our later, the current constitution we have now, the 1984 constitution. So. Well, thank you all. Do you have any questions about anything? Kind of breeze through it. Y'all good? Awesome. Well, I'm going to hang around. Um, I got to get some Indian tacos.